Today, I wish to explore the concept or the Jewish concept of the soul. We're going to see that there are five levels of the soul. Now, I think when we first started talking about the five different universes, no one knows exactly. So this is one way of looking at it, one way that Judaism looks at the soul. Uh, Christianity looks at it slightly differently. And I'm not saying they're right or wrong, um, either one, but Judaism uh, tends to look at it slightly differently. And, and we'll explain that as we go through. The thing is, I, I'm not expecting us to become experts on the five levels of the soul. Uh, I'm not even an expert, right? I'm just giving you a rough paintbrush of what I know, only for the sake of we will come across this more as we study Judaism. You, you might have noticed that uh, Dr. Doug mentioned uh, a couple of the names of the souls a few times. He mentioned the Neshama and things like that. The purpose of this is not to make us experts, but at least when someone raises that or when we come across it in our readings, that we will have some idea of what they're talking about. And it's not just a concept is out there and, well, we don't worry about it. Um, because it does not, while it doesn't impact our salvation, it can impact how we work at our salvation if we understand this concept. And it comes back to a little bit, I love, I was supposed to do this study two weeks ago, I remember? Uh, was it two weeks ago or three weeks, can't remember. And we sort of ran out of time. And lo and behold, this week's Pasha study with the Klippa Noga actually flows right into today's Beit Midrash. So while I might have been a little bit distressed the fact that it didn't work out that day, guess what? Hashem knew. <laughs> so I was of like, Ralph, stop worrying. God knows everything. <laughs> and there we have another Miriam, you see. If it wasn't for Marie, I'd be a grumpy old man. <laughs> Just for, and, and, and to all of you, you people who put you there, <laughs> keep me in control, Marie. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just joking, just joking. I'm really not that bad, am I? <laughs> so, I want to recap though. Go back to, can you do the next slide, please, Elise? Thanks. I wanted to recap briefly the five levels of the universe because the five levels of the soul correspond to this picture that we talked about. So this is from the prayer study as well? This is from the prayer study, yeah. yeah. I, I like that picture I've been using. I'd like to actually fix it up a bit more. To, this is just a copy and paste of different things overlaid. Um, now, remember two Shabbats ago, we talked about the absolute, infinite God creating a universe so he could fit into it a world that if he in his absolute infiniteness would enter would totally destroy that world. He, he's, he is all power, all knowledge, all being everywhere at every time. If he were to come and walk into this room well, he wouldn't even get here because the whole earth would be destroyed before he walked into this room. So he created five universes of ever contracting his glory, for want of a better word, his light, to the point where it's this physical universe, which is almost totally separate from the God of light, apart from the fact that without him, it would be destroyed anyway. So it's a bit of a... A um, bit of a contradiction in terms. He had to separate us so far from him that he wouldn't destroy us, but we still have to be in connection with him, otherwise we would be destroyed, because everything exists through him. He is the source of life. So the way that Judaism has explained that is through um, five levels of contracting himself to the point where this world can exist, and he can interact with this world through what well, we saw firstly as um, the word, um, the spirit hovering over the world, the word, an angel of the Lord. So someone mentioned that um, angel of the Lord thing. 
uh, in with Balaam. Uh, we're going to touch that next week, but that is one of the manifestations. We saw him as Yeshua, and then he contracted himself to the point of death. And remember, we talked about this in the Beit Midrash on um, Bereshit, that from that death, then that light rose again. That's what Judaism says. God contracted himself to that point of death, and then light comes out again. And that's what Yeshua did, right? He died and rose again. The light rose. He was the light to the nation. So, sorry? Uh, when you're talking about um, God's distance from man. Yep. Um, is that to God walking with Adam in the garden? No, and I'm going even further. No. That, that's already God contracting himself to the point where um, he could exist in this realm, or we could exist with him being in this realm. I'm talking about a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all, -knowing, all, powerful, all um, infinite, uh, that in his presence we couldn't exist independently because his will would be so powerful that we would have to submit to his will all the time. We wouldn't have a will of our own. We would be basically puppets in God's hands. Whatever he thought we would do, we have no choice. And that's, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, <laughs> but we'll get there. <laughs> so, the first level that we talked about was a level co called Adam Kod Kadmon. And that's the highest realm. It's not even on this picture. It's, it's such a realm that it's, it's almost incomprehensible for us to explain. So when um, the prophets saw visions of the heavens, when uh, Rav Shul went to the third heaven, uh, none of them have ever been to that point of where God purely exists or the next level below because it's, it's way too much for us to understand. In fact, Rav Shul did say that he, he saw things that he can't even explain, can't even talk about, right? So I think he had a glimpse of that realm because he just can't put into words what he actually saw in that realm. Some of the other prophets saw the lower levels. Um, some saw the wheels on earth. Um, that earthly realm is the lowest realm called um, Asiya. And that's where, where the physical creation is the furthest from Hashem, where it can exist almost independently from Hashem, apart from the fact that without him, it wouldn't exist. But everything else is independent. We talked about the second realm, Atsilut, which... Um, okay, so the first realm was like the mind, God's name. The second will, uh, level was like the, sorry, the first level was like the will. The second level was like the mind area. The third level was like thought. The fourth level was like speech. And the fifth level was completion, the physical thing. So it starts off the mind of God coming to a thought, coming to a speech, forming something that physically exists on earth. That's the sort of process. And we keep that in mind because we're going to talk about how Hashem created man in a similar sort of way. <clears throat> but before we do that, we're going to talk about the purpose of creation. <clears throat> Why did Hashem create the universe and everything in it? God had absolutely no need to create the world because he is absolutely perfect. He's absolute perfection. He has no need for anything. There was no need in God. So why did he create the world? He must have had a purpose because our God is a God of purpose. So whatever he does, there's a purpose behind it. And that purpose is not a need. So he didn't need mankind. He had a purpose to create mankind. So when we look at God himself, what are we taught about the purpose of creation? Not much. Sorry? Yes, much. One thing we can observe from God, though, is that he is good. So we know that, and we sang that song before, you know, how good God is. We know that not only is Hashem good, but he also defines what good is. Every act of God 
contains the most pure and infinite good, in capital letters, that can exist. Good is a de de derivation of the word God. So that's where good comes from. So it, even God exists in good, if you know what I mean. He created good. He is good. He defines good. His goodness and his love are the two most basic of God's qualities that can be understood. They work together to bring about his purpose. We read in Psalm 145.9, Adonai is good to all. His compassion rests on all his creatures. So if God created the universe and everything in it for a purpose, pardon me. <clears throat> I'm sure you heard that online. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's the good thing about these beautiful uh, sensitive mics. They can hear everything. So um, if, I, if you hear my stomach rumbling, sorry about that. <laughs> so if God created the universe and everything in it with a purpose, and we know that God is good, then we can surmise that God created the universe for the purpose of bestowing good upon whatever he created. In fact, God himself calls his creation an act of goodness. Bereshit 131. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And this indicates that the creation of the universe was an expression of his goodness. Still doesn't tell us why, but we know... We know what? The universe is an expression of his goodness. Man was created last in order of creation, which indicates that the world was actually created for man's existence. Isaiah 45 2 tells us, I am the one who made the earth. I created human beings on it. So, it is man who will ultimately be the recipient of God's goodness and thereby fulfill the purpose of creation. We are the purpose of creation. Well, actually, God bestowing goodness upon us is his whole purpose of creation. The Talmud gives us a parable to illustrate this point. A king once built a beautiful palace, decorated it lavishly and stocked it with the best food and drink. When it was all finished, he invited his guests, saying, If there are no guests, then what pleasure does the king have with all the good things that he has prepared? So this is how Judaism explains why God created the world. He created the world so beautifully for us to live in it, to enjoy it, to have pleasure in it. Remember, there's nothing wrong with the worldly things. It's just how you apply them. It's, it's not... Money, that is the problem. It's the love of money that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to have money. But when it becomes your God, that's the problem. It's okay to enjoy physical pleasures in this world. And they become your God. That's the problem. So God has, has created this whole world for us to enjoy. So enjoy it. You know, we see God in nature everywhere. Romans tells us that. If we look around, we should be seeing God because he created it. It's his creation, his goodness that we can enjoy. So two weeks ago, we said that man was made in the image and likeness of Hashem, as it states in Bereshit 126. And so if man is made in the image of Hashem, he should also have a free will, right? Because Hashem is all will. He is free will. Like there's no one that forces him to do anything. He has a will to choose. His will actually created the whole world. It had to be his will to create without a will, it never would have happened. Remember the uh, going, so back one slide, thanks. Um, will was the very first thing of man. He had to will in order to have a mind, in order to think, in order to speak, in order to create. It all had to start with his will. So if we're made in the image of Hashem, then we have a will as well. We have a free will to do good and be accountable for this action and consequently receive good from Hashem who wants to bestow good things on us when we make the right choice, our free will. If Hashem were to create man at his own level of existence in his realm of the universe that I talked about before where he just exists and nothing else, if we could even exist in that realm, 
our will would be totally his will. As I said, we would be puppets. We would not be able to independently do anything because whatever he thought, whatever he wanted, we would have to do. That's how, that's the, it's a realm that we find very difficult, difficult to explain, but that's the realm that God is God in. There is nothing besides him in that realm. And if we were to step in that realm, our complete will would be under his submission. <clears throat> so in order to have free will exist in man, man had to be created in a realm where God was almost undetectable, but yet not so far separated from God that it would be destroyed. So that, that dichotomy, you know, God has to remove himself so far so that we can have free will, yet he still has to be close enough so that we don't get totally destroyed because of the lack of God, because everything exists because of him. And this is what Hashem did through the creation of the five levels of the universe. This self-constriction allows God to be in the world, interact with us, without us, creation being nullified. And that's the concept of simsum. That's the Hebrew word for contraction. Simsum to the physical universe allows for the concealment of God's presence to the point where, uh, and I quote, it is all but completely undetected and yet maintaining absolute unity that he is. And we also must balance these ever concealing realms, the concealment of Hashem from the physical universe with the fact that it says in Colossians 1.17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So, so he's out there yet he's still here. We can't remove God so much from the physical that everything falls apart. Yep. And, and that is one of the things that we need to remember when we judge other people, um, even non-believers, because guess what? They are still created in his image. Inside the very core is still that, inside the very core, okay? Back to the red heifer. See, can you see the analogy? There is still the image of God in there, yet it's corrupted on the outside. For some of us, we're a little bit less corrupted on the outside, but we're all corrupted at the end of the day. Hopefully we'll get to some of this. How, how do we remove that corruption at the end of this uh, study? <laughs> yep. So the five levels of the human soul. Since we have five realms of the universe, Hashem created us in five levels, created the human soul in five levels. So I'm just going to ask a question. What is our previous understanding of the, the human existence? You know, we have what? Body, soul, spirit. You mean, what were, what were we taught before? Yeah. So prior to his understanding of the five levels of the soul. We, have, we, we haven't even got this far yet, but yeah. yes. <laughs> spirit, soul. Spirit, soul, and body, right? We have, we are a spirit, we have a mind, and we live in a body, right? So that's, that's what all, I've always been taught in Christendom. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying there's a different way of looking at it. In the Hebrew, in the scriptures, where we read spirit and we read soul, they are derivatives of, a, of the same sort of Hebrew context. So... That's why I suppose our understanding, when we don't get the Hebrew right, our understanding of spirit, soul, and body are different to what Hebrew understanding is. And our soul is what? Our mind, our will, and emotions. Okay? Um, so that, that's the typical understanding. But in reality, sorry, in, not in reality, but in the picture of what Judaism says, remember we talked about the mind, uh, the will being up the top, the mind, and then the soul actually comes in right down the bottom, near the bottom. Mm -hmm. so, so Judaism has that concept um, 
uh, in the previous slide anyway, um, has that concept of the mind is something that's closer to Hashem. So the will is closest, the mind is next, and the soul is even further down. It's not as if uh, our mind has, uh, not as if our soul has those three things, but they're all part of the one soul in that linear thing rather than an earth, earthy like thing. Layers. Yeah, they're more like layers rather than all in one bunch. <clears throat> but in reality, there is no scripture in the Tanakh or in the apostolic writings that actually explains what our soul, what our mind, what our will are. These are concepts that we've come up with from other theologies, other um, Greek thinking. Um, Judaism has looked at, you know, um, Kabbalah and come up with their understanding. Christianity has taken some Greek thinking to come up with those concepts. Yeah. So, the closest we can get... Okay. But one step back, the English words do not give us adequate understanding. For example, Bereshit 2.7 says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and a man became a living soul. The word for breath in the Hebrew is neshama, which could also mean divine inspiration, intellect, blast, soul, or spirit. So we've interpreted that as spirit. He breathed his spirit into him. But the Hebrew word is actually neshama. It's different to ruach. See, in English, we put the ruach, or we say spirit, and we use it for all those different neshama, nefesh, ruach. And so we've lost that understanding of the different context that Hashem actually puts into us. So, yep. When your spirit leaves, you still have a personality. Well, you know, in the resurrected body. Right. You're still going to have the same spirit or the same, uh, as far as personality comes to play. Let, let's go. Let's go through the study, and we'll we'll see a different understanding of of the spirit. Okay, because what you're actually asking requires me to go through the study. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be answered through the through the. Yeah. In, in, with, with regards to personality, um, that is that is both something that is you're born with, but is also shaped by environment. So. There's a couple of different things that, that we're not going to touch on this. We're going to look at slightly differently. Yep. Yeah, yep. And we'll see why in a minute. <laughs> no, you're right. It's good. It's, these are good questions. And hopefully... Hopefully, I will be able to answer them. <laughs> okay, I'll try my best. I can't promise you. And some of you may walk away more confused than you came in. <laughs> but the good point is, this will be online, and you can watch it online a few times. Hopefully, look at the scriptures that I've got, um, and then we can talk about it next week again. <laughs> so what God breathed into man was not his spirit, but the neshama that exited God's mouth and ended up in a man as a living nefesh. So the shama and nefesh, again, are two different things. And this was translated as soul, the nefesh, soul. But in reality, we'll see in a minute, according to Judaism's interpretation, all of those are part of the soul. They're just different levels of the soul. So since there are no real scriptural passages in the Bible that adequately describe what a soul is or its connection to the eternal one, it's necessary to have a look at some of the rabbis and sages' teachings. I did a bit of a research and found that there's very little by the rabbinical sages as well 
in their literature as to, me, could you please get me a glass of water, mate? Thanks. Uh, this bit here, but I need some more, thanks. <clears throat> There's not much that tells us about the soul in rabbinic literature. The only thing that we have is where it talks about uh, the prayer, um, the prayer upon rising, which talks about restoring the soul. And that's the only thing in literature, in the rabbinic literature, that gives us any clue. Uh, and so in, thanks Marie, in that prayer, it basically says, when you go to sleep, Hashem takes your soul, and when you wake up, Hashem puts the soul back, and you give him thanks for restoring your soul. That's a Jewish concept. I personally struggle a little bit with that one because I have to go up to the toilet a few times every night. So God's pretty busy pum, 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 with my soul, okay? <laughs> but he does restore my soul every day, okay? So I have an understanding of that Hashem does restore my soul because his mercy is in you every morning. So I understand there's a concept there. Maybe I picture it wrongly what Judaism is saying, but I understand that uh, what were you saying, Ray? There's a picture of the of the end time millennium when you will be resurrected. When you will be resurrected. resurrected. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. That's why they might say that he takes you and puts you back because yep. you really don't feel like you're there. You really feel like you're somewhere like else. Yeah. <laughs> but I tell you what, God's busy with me. <laughs> and a few others that have bladder problems and so on. Oops, did I say that? <laughs> Uh, they're sleeping with their fathers. Yeah. Uh, so they're in the place sleeping. But um, I was sort of thinking about when Jesus resurrected the 12 year old girl and just told everyone she was sleeping, she wasn't there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. In Judaism, you don't actually die as such. You go to be with your forefathers, with your, yeah. So you basically go to sleep. So the town of Jerusalem, in a tractate called Mixture 8.4, suggests that the spirit, the life, and soul originate with God, but the body belongs to human parents. The Greek view, on the other hand, which is found in Hellistic Judaism, or uh, Hellistic Judea, was that the body, which was sinful and impure, was a trap that debased and hindered the soul. So you, you've got this whole thing, this whole... Uh, concept of the spirit is good. I can't wait to die to be a spirit being because this body is so awful and sinful and it's debased, right? <laughs> so, so there is a bit of truth to that. Remember that this, this body is um, defiled, decayed, dying, right? It's in, a, it's in the world which is full of death. But it was, it's in a fallen state. Thank you. That's right. I was going to say, this, this is not the state that God created originally for Adam, for man to live in. <clears throat> but that, that's like the extreme that's been carried through. And I think the Essenes had a similar type of understanding. That's why they became monks and just became pure and spiritual. Um, but it's, it's back to what we've talked about a few times. You can be so holy in the spirit that you're of no earthly good. We, we have to be earthly as well we have to live in this world not of the world but in this world so that we can fulfill what messiah has for us to do so the body itself is not a bad thing it's just how it's used now there's a commentary in the midrash rabbah on bereshit 2 7 and bereshit 2 7 is where uh, did we read that before i think yep then the Lord God formed man out of the dust and breathed in his nostrils. And the Midrash goes like this. It says, the nephesh. So it talks about the five levels of this soul particular that 
um, we talked about. The nefesh, this is a reference to the force of life containing, contained in the blood. It is, it, as it is stated, for the blood is in the nefesh, in Deuteronomy 12, 23. The ruach, it ascends to the heavens and descends to the earth, as it is stated, who perceives that the ruach of man is one of the ascend, uh, is one that ascends on high. The neshama, this is the reference of, to human capacity for intelligence. As people say, intelligence is good. The higher living for all the limbs of the body are dead in and of themselves, while the soul alone lives within the body and provides life to the limbs. And the yahida, a singular one, for all the limbs of the body exist in pairs of two, while the soul exists singularly within the body. So, to summarize that, what they're saying is there's five different levels of the soul. The, um, have I summarized them here somewhere? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I knew it was somewhere. There's the nefesh, there's the ruach, there's the neshama, there's the achida, and there's the haya. And I'll, I'll very briefly explain what each one of them is, because we're not going to worry about the details of each one. The name of the soul intent, uh, identified in the Midrash Rabbah, um, Midrash Rabbah, Bereshit 14.9, that corresponds to the realm that's closest to Hashem, is the Yechida. So I know it's the second last one there. That's, it was just the order it was mentioned here. But the Yechida is something that is so close to Hashem. In fact, they get this from Bereshit 2.7, where it says... There's a lamed there um, in front of the nefesh. So it says, le nefesh is the word in Bereshit. And the lamed is an indication of possession. So Hashem's saying that this is my nefesh, right, that I've breathed into you. In other words, this is so close to me that it's actually me, me, part of me. It's at my level. Yeah. This indicates that man's soul is an extension of God's breath and is directly connected to Hashem. So our soul actually starts within Hashem. And I'll, I'll bring you a beautiful analogy in a minute that will summarize it. Uh, the Yahaya, uh, which is the next realm, um, is the realm of the living essence. Uh, it's described this way. The mysterious force upon which all life depends, the amazing vitality that empowers the seed to sprout. This is the soul level that is at the center of life, that unfolds like a flower constantly opening, whose, whose center is at the very center of the universe. So, uh, Arya Kaplan says it this way, it says, it, it is actually the experience of being within the realm of the divine. In reality, we're not going to worry about those two realms at all because uh, Judaism says those two realms are reserved for the world to come. You know, when we are um, in our new um, bodies and the earth in heaven are destroyed and we have a new Jerusalem created and there's no more sun. So the world's going to look totally different in that new creation, in that world to come. And that's the level of our soul that we will be experiencing Hashem in, those upper levels. For now, it's way beyond our understanding, way beyond our comprehension. It's what Rav Shul said, there's things there that I can't talk about because there's just too much, too far. That's the new heaven. It's the new heaven and the new earth. It's not, not planet earth, yeah. Yep. It, if, sorry, Elise, if you could go back to the uh, first slide. It's going to be up in that upper realm where you see the, the throne of Hashem. It's not going to be in the physical realm. So it's not going to be an earth. It's not going to be a physical planet where we stand on. That's all gone. It's going to be up in that um, where the angels are standing, burning. It's going to be in that sort of sphere. That's going to be the lower. That's going to be the footstool of us one day. 
and we'll be up in that higher realm. But for now, we're on this earth. So it's something that we don't have to worry about. It's in the future. This day I'll see you in paradise. Yep. Yep. No, nothing to do with that. <laughs> it's remember. No, no. We we think we're going to heaven when we die, but that's not necessarily. We before Yeshua took captivity captive, we went to a place called Abraham's bosom, and that was the. Well, Abraham's bosom is paradise, but there was a separation to a place called the Ahenim, where the unrighteous souls are. So Abraham's bosom was the. No, it's a department of Sheol. Oh, sorry, of Ge Sheol. Yeah, the grave. But but after that, Yeshua took captivity captive and brought them to a place somewhere in there. But probably the four living creatures realm, I would say. So uh, Sheol was that where David had his father. Uh, yeah, yeah, which would have been Abraham's bosom because he was a righteous man. <clears throat> oh, I have a question online. Yeah, they, actually, they can hear you online because they, sorry, they could probably see the question, couldn't they? So you just need to tell me, I think. Ah, uh, to the, um, don't know off the top of my head. If someone can look it up, thanks. Yeah. Yep. We're look, yeah, we're looking it up. So the next level down is what's called the Neshama. The Neshama is the soul that corresponds to the Berea level of the universe. So you can see there Berea, which is thought, which sort of lines up where the angels are sitting. <clears throat> So this has a certain degree of separation from the divine being, but it's still in the heavenly realm. It's still, um, it's a realm where the soul that yearns to be one with the creator, uh, that part pulls us on the spiritual path. So if you want to put it this way, it's two levels above where we are right now. So this is the lowest realm, the flesh. Sorry, guys. This is the flesh. Then the next realm is the spirit. And then the next realm is the neshama. So the spirit sits between the body and the neshama. I'm saying it in levels, but, but it's not actually like that. It's more, it's more an internal thing. But I'm trying to get a picture of what it would be like in a physical thing. So it's that, it's that the neshama that yearns to be close. It's the one that's pulling us towards Hashem who's further out there, but yet he's actually further inside of us, if that makes sense. Because Hashem's not out there. He's actually, what did Yeshua say? The kingdom of God is within you. It's everything that I'm trying to explain is not a physical thing out there. It's actually within us because Hashem has created the spirit within us and we are linked internally to him. But but trying to explain it is like looking at a physical, here we are in the flesh, there's the spirit, and there's the neshama, the next level up. But it's actually closer to Hashem, if that makes sense. <laughs> I told you it'd be more confused when I finish. To 2 Corinthians chapter 12, is it? Thanks. That's where the verse about uh, Rav Shul. And it is the third heaven, isn't it? Yes. Sorry? Four, fourth heaven. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was the fourth heaven. Yeah, so that's what. No. So, so I'm, I can't hear you. They're saying it's four o'clock. What time? Oh, four o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> oh, probably another twenty minutes or so. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Have, have everybody got time? Yes. I thought you were saying he's gone to the fourth heaven. Then I put Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse four. No. <laughs> four strikes and I'm out. Oh. <laughs> 
so the, the division of 6 12, a week five times education of that, and against Prince Elijah, how we grew in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. So, where would you put that heavenly places? Right. So, <laughs> there, there are actually three heavens on this earth. Yeah. <laughs> There's the physical heaven that sits above us. There's the atmosphere around us, which is called the heaven. That is the realm that uh, demons we fight in, in the realm that's around us. We don't go to the heavenly heavenlies, to that sort of realm up there to fight. The, this is actually Hasatan's realm, this, this kingdom. So he, he's in the air around us, in the, this heavenly realm. Yeah. Yep. And what realm is that? Daniel. Uh, in, in this realm. Remember, he was trying to get through to Daniel. Yeah. Where is Daniel in this realm? The angel was fighting him in this earthly realm, in this not physical earth, but in the air that's around us to try and get to Daniel. Yeah. Mm. Yep. The, yeah. So, so it's people on, in earth, on earth, that are being impacted by the spiritual realm that's around us. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next level. So the Neshama is the one that wants to draw us close to Hashem. Um, we'll get to that. That's, that's not the Neshama. That, that's the next level, right? Bear with me. So in the spiritual in the spiritual realm, there is no concept of space and the idea of being close to someone. So remember, the neshama is the one that's trying to draw close to Hashem. But in that realm, there is no uh, concept of space. So what does closeness mean then? Closeness means, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. When we are close to Hashem through the Neshama, we become the image and likeness of Hashem. Closeness in this context is the Neshama wants to be in the image of Hashem. Not close to Him physically, but become like the image of Hashem. Sorry? Resemblance. Yes, resemblance. Yes. Yeah. Because we are made in His image. So that's our desire. Not, not our flesh and our stupid mind, but our Neshama, the one that's closer to Hashem, that wants to be like him. That you know, that's our desire. That's but we'll get to that in a minute. Time comes into the realm of the Ruach. So uh, see the level four? That's where time has actually started to be part of that creation, part of that forming. And that's the realm of the Ruach which we're coming into now. The word says in the creature of the heart, when he appears the second time, we shall see him as he is, and we shall be like him. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So we call this the Ruach level, we call this the spirit. Um, it corresponds to the Yetz, Yetzirah, and it is, an, it is where the outlet out. So is where the otherworldly creatures exist, such as angels, demons, uh, the invisible side of nature, the spiritual forces that lie immediately beyond our physical domain. And I think we talked about this last time. We can walk into a room and sense something in that room. That's not our body. That's not our physical body. That's our ruach, which is sensitive to the realm of the spirit. Okay. Um, so while we can be um, perceptive to the creatures in this realm it's a matter of which realm a person allows and trains himself to be sensitive to the neshama or the nefesh which is the lowest level the flesh so this is what paul talks about being the battle that's within us are we going to give into the flesh, to our earthly desires, or is our ruach going to give into the neshama, which is our heavenly desire to be closer to Hashem, to be closer as in the image of Hashem? So, 
as we'll see shortly, the Nishama operates in the realm furthest removed and most distant from the, the being that is without end, the Ein Self. The Nishama operates in the realm of the flesh, fulfilling the physical needs of the body. And Dr. Doug may have talked about this uh, a while ago. He said, there's nothing wrong with fulfilling the desires of the flesh. We are told to go and procreate and make more children, right? That is a physical thing. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a commandment from Hashem. So there's nothing wrong with sex within marriage, so to speak, right? To procreate more children. We often say, oh, it's bad, it's bad. But no, God gave this fleshly earth, uh, fleshly existence for us to procreate, make more children. So there's nothing wrong with that as such. It's when it's abused, that's where the problem is. When it goes outside of God's boundaries, so to speak, that's when the sexual thing, that's when the flesh, that's when the money, when all those things become a problem. So this earthly existence is part of God's creation and he has a plan for it. <clears throat> so even in the spiritual realm, there is no concept of space yet. For something then to be distant, it means to be different or opposite. So remember we talked about closeness being not a physical thing, but a likeness. So to be distant from Hashem means to be different or opposite to Hashem. It's not distant as in I'm walking away. It's my image is actually not the same as what Hashem's image is. And that's what distance means. So, so when we're talking about being distant from Hashem, it's not as if God suddenly moved away from us. It's when, when we choose to operate in an image that's different to the image of God, then we become distant. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. In um, Kaplan's words, the Nashama and the Nefesh represent, respectively, the two opposite concepts of giving and receiving. They are spiritually distant and opposite to one another. It is therefore the Ruach, which is the intermediate link between the Nashama and the Nefesh, and transmits spiritual energy from the Nashama to the Nefesh. So it's the Ruach, the spirit, that is that middle ground between the nefesh and the neshama that is the one that connects the two and it's our spirit that will determine whether we operate in the neshama or in the nefesh in the in the realm closest to god or in the body which is the realm furthest from god the ruach of the soul is the level that experiences the sea of spirituality the otherworldly creatures that exist around us in the realm of yetzirah when a person becomes aware and sensitive to the Ruach, they become aware of completely different motion around them, different to what their physical body experiences. This realm in which information is communicated and people can see visions, hear things, become conscious of higher levels of spirituality, reaching the level of the Ruach, one feels a moving spirit rather than a quiet one. Now, I've always wondered what Yeshua meant when he said in Yohanan 3.8, and we've, we've used this to say, I, I can do whatever I want in the Spirit because the Spirit leads me here and the Spirit leads me there. But listen to what he says. He says, the wind blows where it wants to, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes to. That's how it is with everyone who has been born from the Spirit. Yeshua is actually talking about you become sensitive to this realm of the spirit. You're out of the flesh, right? It's the things in the next realm that you can start to experience, the movement of other creatures in this being, the visions, the dreams, all of that that's in the realm of the spirit. That's what Yeshua is referring to. He's not saying you can now go off and do whatever you think you're led to. What it means is the wind blows. You can feel the wind. You can feel that spirit. You don't know exactly where it's coming from or going to but you can feel a spiritual sensation around you. Yeah. 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 That makes perfect sense. Now you're perceptive to a higher 
That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean you just go off and do whatever you want. It actually means you are sensitive to the things that are around you. You don't, you don't necessarily know where they're going or coming from, but you can feel it. You can sense it. It's like I said, you walk into a room, you go, oh, something here is that's not right. But you can look around and physically everything is good, but you're sensing something in the spirit that doesn't quite um, match. And you, yeah, that's right. Some people see, some people hear, some have visions, dreams, um, voices. That's all in the spiritual realm. That's where that comes from. So the nefesh is the lowest realm, the ultimate goal of contraction, getting to this earthly body, earthly being. Uh, we saw also in Isaiah 54, 7, that God created darkness and evil. Remember, darkness and evil had to be created, but light and good existed already. So... Um, Hashem didn't have to create those because he just formed them from who he was. But darkness and evil had to be created, especially because he doesn't actually have any of that in him. So it required a level of creation and not just forming from who he is. It is this realm of darkness and evil that the nephish of man exists in, the body, uh, in a body of flesh which could be likened to a receptacle of the spirit. The term nefesh illustrate, uh, it literally means a resting soul. So that's what the nefesh, so God's breath comes to a rest in this being. Let me read a beautiful analogy or picture uh, from Ariel Kaplan. Yep. Yes, yeah, very good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So this relationship can be illustrated with the analogy. Imagine a glass blower who decides to make a beautiful vessel. This decision, right, emanating from the innermost will is that highest level of the universe that we talked about. It corresponds to the, that uh, universe of Adam Kadmon. The next, we see the glass blower himself before he begins to blow out. This is the level of the higher, the living essence, corresponding to the universe of Atzilut, the next one down, where the life force is still within the realm of the divine. So the breath to form that glass hasn't come out of the, the divine yet. It's still within him. So he has a will to do it, his body is holding that breath, so that's the next uh, mind. Next, the breath, the neshama, emanates from the mouth of the glass blower and flows as a pressurized wind, ruach, through the glass blowing pipe, expanding it in all directions and forming a crude vessel. The wind finally comes to rest, nefesh, in the completed vessel. Uh, this analogy allows us to visualize our own direct connection with the divine. So while we might feel distant from Hashem, we aren't. We are always connected through that breath that comes out into that glass blower. That, that physical body is the glass where the breath finally comes to rest. But there's a connection always back to Hashem, always back to his spirit. Yeah, the of the breath. The actual blow that I actually see when I was in Italy. Yeah, when I was in Italy, I was in Mulano. Yeah. Mm. It's quite fascinating that according to the strength that's going, that they're blowing, it can expand, it can shorten, yeah. it can go wider, it can go thinner. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It's all to do with how they breathe into the, uh, the, glass. the glass. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So here comes the crunch part. At the level of the nefesh, uh, we now have an environment that sets up where, uh, where man is separated enough from God uh, to be able to choose between good and evil. Whoa, this is the hard part, eh? Man can now freely choose the good of Hashem, the light, and the evil of created darkness. 
And consequently, Hashem can reward man with the ultimate gift of himself when he chooses good over evil. Kaplan sums it up like this. The very existence of evil, in fact, is solely in order to be transformed by man into the act of choosing good. Through this struggle, man attains shalom, peace, and unifies himself with God the Creator. Does that make sense? Yeah. So evil is only there so that we can choose to do good. To exercise, <laughs> to exercise our free will and choose God. <laughs> to make it into good. So That's right. Yeah. That is his likeness. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, to Kun Alam. Restoration. Restoration. Restoring this world. To, to what, sorry? Holy. Holy, ah. Angry because my mind immediately went to, um, you know, when you're doing something that you know is a problem, they're jealous of you, you're jealous of you, and they voice it. They yep. voice it in jealousy. We can attest to that. They do so with a lie as well. <laughs> and That can happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> he does. He got angled. Yeah. Jesus made a whip and Yeah, that's that that's again a little bit misunderstood, but yeah, he did he did get righteous anger. Correct. Mm. Yep. Sin not. That's right. That's the thing. Oh, as you were speaking of God, as you were speaking of what was speaking to me at the same time and saying that we met as a year of thorn, remind, reminds you that you still you yes. and you still have to grow. Okay. So, so now we. That's good. <laughs> and that goes for all of us, mate. So yeah. thanks, yeah. thanks for all awesome. <laughs> Now we. This is where we get to the clipper. Remember we introduced the clipper, the shell, uh, in the last Beit Midrash. So, we have a clipper around us. The clipper in Judaism is also called the Sitra Akra, which means the other side. Not the good side, the other side, right? The dark side. It is considered as a side of impurity and it is opposed to the side of holiness. <laughs> According to um, Nissan David Dubov, there is nothing that is in between. Every thought, every speech, every action, every creation has its source in either Kedusha, holiness, or in Klippa. You can't sit on the fence on this one. You can't be partly good and partly bad. You're either bad or good. <laughs> Not that not quite the right analogy, but everything either comes from good or from bad. You can't have a grey side between good and bad. The very existence, the very purpose of man's existence then is to move from the side of Sitra Akra, from the bad side, the dark side, to the good side, to the holy side. This is done by removing what's called the Klippa. So within us is the essence of Hashem that five levels down to this physical body, he, we are connected to him. It's inside of us. The kingdom of God is inside of us. But covering up that goodness is what's called that clipper, that shell. It protects us, but it also doesn't allow the light to come out. This is why Rav Shul tells us this in Romans 2, 28 to 29. For the real Jew is not merely Jewish outwardly, 
true circumcision is not only external and physical. On the contrary, a real Jew is one inwardly. And a true circumcision is of the heart, spiritual, not literal, so that the, this praise comes not from other people, but from God. Rob is talking about that clipper, that shell, right? Has to be circumcised, has to be cut off and removed. Not physically, but spiritually. The circumcision, the removal of the clipper, the removal of the obstruction, uh, the obstruction has to be done from the heart. The Tanya, uh, which is a book about um, Kabbalah, tells us that the Shema, um, the recital of the Shema into the whole process, uh, tells us uh, about the recital of the Shema and how it is part of the process of removing that clipper, that barrier. What's the Shema again? Shema. Hear, o Israel, Adonai is one, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. And what did we read after that? What does Yeshua say to us after that? Yes. Love your God with all your heart, love your neighbor with all your, as yourself, right? So, Yeshua summed up that whole thing of how do we remove this clipper? Love God, love our fellow man. <laughs> Sounds simple, doesn't it? So, the uh, Rabbi Moshe Hayam Luzato in The Path of the Just supports the same argument. He says this, For a person to be entitled to this good, the good of cleaving to Hashem, who is the ultimate gift to man, it is only appropriate that the first labor sorry, that he first labor and make an effort to acquire it. This means that he must try to cleave to the Blessed One through deeds that will lead to this goal. These deeds are the mitzvah. So I know this is Judaism, right? So this is what Judaism says, to come close to Hashem, to be in his image, we have to do our part and do mitzvah. But what does Yeshua say? Um, where have I got the scripture? He says, I think it's Johanan 14, 15. No. Johanan 14, 15. Yeah, could someone read that? Because I don't have it here, sorry. So remember, remember she was said, um, let your light so shine. Right, okay. Yeah, so that's, um, so that's Yeshua talking about the same thing, doing his commandments if we love him. And then in Johanan 14, yeah. Luke 17. Is it Luke 17? Thanks. Now, for the kingdom of God is within you, that's Luke 17. Okay. Uh, sorry, I can't remember the scripture, but it's where he says that... Um, let your light so shine so that men will glorify, not you, but Hashem. And that's done through our deeds, through our acts. Yeah. Our acts of loving God with all our heart, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Those acts will let the light shine. He's talking about letting the light shine. Where does the light live? Within us. Doing those acts breaks that clip up, not the physical, but the spiritual barrier that's hiding that light of Hashem doing those acts breaks that clipper and lets that light shine so that all men will glorify Hashem. Not us. They won't see us because the light of Hashem will shine at them when we break the clipper. We don't get the glory. Hashem does. If you love me, you will keep my commitments work, commandments. As for me, I will ask of my father and he will give you another advocate who will go with you to the church. So our job is to let that mm -hmm. light shine and ensure that the other people. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So so we're not in this on our own. That's the covenant that Brian's talking about. If we do this, 
he will bring another helper to do this. So we make that step first, and then as we make that step, he comes and helps us through his Ruach, to his spirit. But we have to make the step. That's the whole thing. Remember, we talked about holiness, and we said, uh, God said to us, be holy, for I am holy. How do we become holy? Well, Yeshua said, make the step, and then as we make the step to holiness, Hashem sees us as holy. It's not what we do as such, it's what our heart intent is. But we have to do something as a result of our heart intent that God says, right, you're holy. I see you as holy. And he gives us the Ruach HaKodesh to help us live out that holiness. And that comes back to the breaking of the clipper that we talked about in the red heifer. The one that looks so evil on the outside, the last galut of Edom that looks so evil, the last reign of Christi Christianity, so to speak, that looks so evil to Judaism, when we break that shell and let the light shine of Hashem, then all men will see that Yeshua is the Messiah. Doesn't mean everybody will accept him, but all men will see. Yeah. And then we have prepared the ground for him to come back. So 